And now, ladies and gents, it's yo time. Come with me into the world of celluloid magic. Come enjoy the mystery, the romance, the horror, and the humor. The time. The music, the effects, the sound, the dance, the dance, the dance, the dance. <sighs> Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Theme Park History, the channel for everything to do with theme parks. Old and new, big and small. In today's episode, we're put in the middle of some of the most iconic moments from some of the most memorable films as we explore The Great Movie Ride, a dark ride that opened at Disney's Hollywood Studios on May 1st, 1989. This attraction was suggested by fans of the silver screen, so thank you to everyone for the comments. Touted as the original flagship attraction of Hollywood Studios, The Great Movie Ride casts guests on a spectacular journey into cinema, including visits to such classic movies as The Wizard of Oz, Casablanca, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Alien. A combination of a live show and dark ride with some of the most advanced audio animatronics created at the time, the park's longest and most iconic attraction was one of the most unique designed by Imagineers, not only presenting some of the greatest movies ever made, but also capturing the spirit of Hollywood's golden age. Okay, everybody, let's do this. We're finally out of pre-production, and we're about to film the first scene of this video. All right, here's your motivation. You're a viewer. You want to learn about this once iconic attraction. You want to find out about its origins, its rise, and its fall. Remember, you're eager to learn, but that doesn't mean you won't leave a comment if I make a mistake during the voiceover. And you know what? About that last part, we're going to improvise that, all right? Let's leave it a little bit loosey-goosey. Uh, well, we'll play it as it goes. Okay, are we good? We got sound? Are we rolling? Are we rolling? All right, sets, sets. Everybody in their places? Good, excellent. All right, here we go. The theme park history of the great movie ride, take one. Lights, camera, action. As we've mentioned in many of our previous videos that you can go and binge, the idea for an attraction that represented the golden age of Tinseltown dates all the way back to 1982 after the opening of the theme park of the 21st century. A group of Imagineers led by Marty Scarl and Randy Bright began brainstorming ideas for new pavilions that could be added within the Future World section of Epcot. Of all the concepts they came up with, the group focused on two specific themes, healthcare and Disney's own industry, entertainment. The end results would be the Wonders of Life Pavilion, which concentrated on the human body, physical fitness, medicine, and nutrition, while the Film Pavilion enthralled Hollywood, filmmaking, and show business. Originally to be placed between the land and Journey into Imagination Pavilions, the Film Pavilion was designed to look like a movie set backdrop, including a soundstage background and a small ticket booth entrance, embracing the magic of Hollywood into the building's facade. The marquee attraction of the pavilion called Great Moments at the Movies would have everything to do with entertainment, offering an inside look into the magic of filmmaking in a time-bending setting, one in which guests would not only experience a movie, but be part of it as well. When newly appointed CEO and everyone's favorite Disney punching bag Michael Eisner saw the plans for the film Pavilion, he requested that instead of placing it in an already existing park, for it to become the anchor of a brand new theme park instead. In February 1985, at his very first shareholder meeting, Eisner announced plans for a third theme park at Walt Disney World, one to be a blend of iconic movie moments and behind-the-scenes magic which included a backlot tour and working movie studio, Disney MGM Studios. Taking up 135 acres with a price tag of $300 million, the new park was themed to look like the classic Hollywood era from the 1920s to the 1940s, with areas and buildings made to look like real landmarks from La La Land, including Grauman's Chinese Theater and Hollywood Boulevard. Besides operating as a theme park, Disney MGM Studios also functioned as a working television and movie studio, offering guests a first-hand view of how some of their favorite shows and films are made, including such hits as World Championship Wrestling and The Lottery starring Bette Midler. I wonder how many people are going to get that reference? Besides those award-winning productions, the actual attractions within the park could be described as a celebration of Hollywood, each revealing the behind-the-scenes magic of the silver screen. As for that great moments at the movie's attraction, it was still planned to come to the park, 
Now's a homage to, you guessed it, great moments of classic films throughout history to present day. Construction of the attraction, as well as the rest of the park, would begin in early 1986. In regards to great moments at the movies, it was proposed that instead of just featuring the company's own movies throughout the attraction to also incorporate films from other studios as well, as outside of the animation department, its live-action catalog ranged from mediocre to just plain out terrible. There was just one problem with that proposal, Universal Pictures, known for its iconic characters and classic movies, was in the middle of building its own theme park inspired by those same characters and movies just down the road on Interstate 4, Universal Studios, Florida. With no chance of acquiring the rights to any of Universal's movies for the attraction, Eisner turned to another movie studio that not only had its start during the Golden Age, but also featured its own impressive collection of classic movies, Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios, better known as MGM. Studios, which I would like to remind everyone was acquired by Amazon for $8.5 billion. Capitalism at its finest. Around the same time as Eisner's hire as CEO, MGM was struggling as a whole, as many of its major releases in theaters were box office bombs. Desperate for an influx of cash and looking to take advantage of their dire situation, in June 1985, MGM and Eisner came to an agreement for a 20-year, $10 million licensing contract that gave Disney worldwide rights to use the MGM brand and logo at the new park, now to be officially called Disney MGM Studios, as well as separate contracts for the rights to use films The Wizard of Oz, Casablanca, Singing in the Rain, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, The Public Enemy, Tarzan and His Mate, and Footlight Parade within the great moments at the movie's attraction. This agreement between the two companies wouldn't be a match made in heaven, as once MGM found out that the park was an actual working movie and television production facility, they sued Disney in 1988, eventually settling in 1992, allowing Disney to continue using the MGM name and logo at the theme park, while MGM was allowed to open a movie-themed theme park of its own. MGM Grand Adventures Theme Park in Las Vegas, which opened in 1993 and closed 18 years later in 2002. Getting back on track about great moments at the movies, besides acquiring the rights to feature many of the previously mentioned MGM movies, Disney was also able to acquire the rights to two specific films, Alien, owned by 20th Century Fox, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, owned by Lucasfilm. While the Indiana Jones franchise eventually received its own attractions within Disney theme parks, Parks, including the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular also at Disney MGM Studios, as well as the Indiana Jones Adventure at Disneyland and Tokyo Disney Sea. Plans for an alien-inspired attraction never came to fruition, leaving guests with the what could have been but still pretty awesome extraterrestrial alien encounter, which opened at the Magic Kingdom in 1995. Other films were also planned to be featured within the attraction, including 20th Century Fox's Young Frankenstein and Columbia Pictures' Ghostbusters. But Disney couldn't come to an agreement with the film studios. In the case of Ghostbusters, Disney wanted to feature all four of the main characters via animatronics during the scene where they fight the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. However, once Bill Murray refused to grant likeness rights for his animatronic, the deal fell apart, ironically opening the door for Universal to come into its own agreement to create its own attraction inspired by the film at Universal Studios Florida, the Ghostbusters Spooktacular. Built within a 95,000 square foot show building, the attraction was housed within a full-scale reproduction of Hollywood's legendary Grauman's Chinese Theater. With over two years of research done by Imagineers to make sure it was faithful to the original, going as far as using the original building's 1927 blueprints during construction, standing at 96 feet tall, the Disney version was built to resemble how the theater looked in the late 1930s and early 1940s, with the pagoda roof alone standing 45 feet tall and weighing 22 tons, built completely out of copper and hoisted into place by a crane. In a cruel twist, Disney wasn't allowed to use the word Grommans when naming their own theater, only able to describe it as the Chinese theater. Just like with the original, in front of the theater, many celebrities would leave their handprints throughout the years, including such Hollywood stars as LeVar Burton, Tom Cruise, Michael Jackson, and of course, Mickey and Minnie Mouse. 
As for the ride itself, it would be similar to Epcot's Universe of Energy, utilizing the traveling theater and its trackless guidance system. In order for this technology to work, a wire just an eighth of an inch thick is embedded in the floor in the desired path of the ride vehicles. The guide wire transmits a low-level radio signal that the vehicle listens for. The vehicle follows a path where the signal remains strongest, closely following the guide wire and thus the intended path. Sensors attached to the vehicles would activate audio and visual effects throughout the various ride scenes. While similar to Universe of Energy, the new attraction's vehicles were slightly smaller, grouped together in pairs of two, and featured an open cab in the first row of the front vehicle for a live tour guide to stand, provide narration, and operate the vehicle, following the guide wire along the 1,926 feet of ride track. The attraction's original script was over 60 pages long with no recorded narration, relying on the tour guide to remember their rehearsed spiel, vehicle operating cues, and interactions with both synced animatronics and other live actors. The attraction features 59 audio animatronic replicas of legendary movie stars, including the likes of Gene Kelly, Dick Van Dyke, Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, and Harrison Ford. In almost every situation, either the movie star, their family, or heir to their estate gave the final approval on their animatronic, which included everything from the face, hair, and costume. At the time of the attraction's opening, the Wicked Witch of the West audio animatronic was the most complex figure ever built by Imagineers, as the A100 had 17 body functions which allowed it to move quickly while absorbing the pressure of the entire body during a single movement by acting as a shock absorber. A combination of software, customized hydraulic valves, and hydraulic actuators took the so-called shake out of the figure, creating a lifelike appearance that eventually became the groundwork for the more advanced audio animatronics featured at Disney parks today. During its construction, the attraction underwent a few substantial substantial changes due to licensing issues. While the Wizard of Oz is represented with two scenes, Imagineers had plans to include an additional two more before being transported to Munchkinland. Just like in the movie, guests would have found themselves in the tornado scene. Besides the F5 tornado, plans also called for an expanded Emerald City scene in which guests would have encountered the floating head of the wizard, who would have said his famous line, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It would be at this point that the live cast member from the ride would appear from behind the curtain, taking a bow for their Oscar-worthy performance. These two scenes never came to life as when Disney negotiated with MGM for the rights to use the film, they only paid for three minutes of its audio, which included the Munchkins singing Follow the Yellow Brick Road, the Wicked Witch's dialogue, and Dorothy's dialogue when seeing the Emerald City. When MGM told Disney to show them the money for the additional scenes, Disney said now nah, we're good and instead rethemed the tornado scene to their own animated classic Fantasia. In addition to those Wizard of Oz scenes, the other major change to great moments at the movies was its finale. Instead of the montage of classic film moments, guests would have entered a dramatically lit room, where they would have been surrounded by some of cinema's greatest characters, including R2-D2 and C-3PO, Rocky Balboa, the Ghostbusters, Mary Poppins, Indiana Jones, Shirley Temple, and of course that cheesy bastard, Mickey Mouse. The name of the attraction also changed about a year before the theme park opened. Not gonna lie, I almost totally forgot to mention it. While no reason was ever officially given to why the name changed, The Great Movie Ride just seems to roll off the tongue a bit better than Great Moments at the Movies. The Great Movie Ride, along with the rest of Disney MGM Studios, officially opened on May 1st, 1989. While Disney has never revealed exactly how much the attraction cost to be built, reports suggest it to be anywhere between 45 to 50 million dollars. Located on Hollywood Boulevard within the park, guests enter the attraction which is within a recreation of Grauman's Chinese Theater. Heading inside the theater, guests make their way through the lobby, full of genuine movie props, set pieces, and costumes from classic films on display. Mary's Carousel Horse from Mary Poppins, The Ark of the Covenant from Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Sam's Piano from Casablanca to name a few. The queue then takes guests into an actual theater, where trailers of the various films that are featured during the ride play before a pair of automatic doors at the front open, leading into the loading area designed as a 1930s era Hollywood soundstage. Guests board one of two pairs of open, theater-style seating ride vehicles, each able to hold up to 70 riders per vehicle. Once everyone is on board, their live tour guide tells them it's showtime, before telling CB, short for famous Hollywood director Cecil B. DeMille, ready when he is. CB yells action, and just like that, the vehicles begin to move 
the song Hooray for Hollywood begins to play, and the tour officially begins. Passing under a large, colorful neon theater marquee, the tour guide tells guests this is no ordinary tour because the great movie ride brings movies to life, putting them right in the middle of the action. The first genre of films introduced are musicals, which starts with a cake of starlets in a scene from the 1933 Busby Berkeley spectacular Footlight Parade. While the cake rotated and was adorned with water jets just like in the film, throughout the attraction's first year, the rotating mechanism constantly broke down, causing frequent repairs repairs and downtime. In addition, the water pumps would constantly fail, flooding the ride path. To address these issues, the scene was altered significantly, leaving the cake stationary behind a large scrim, in which lighting effects simultaneously illuminated the fabric with washes of light and reflective water effects instead of using the water pumps. As the vehicles continue forward, guests pass by Don Lockwood, played by Gene Kelly, swinging from a lamppost from the 1952 film Singin' in the Rain, followed by Mary Poppins and Burke played by Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke, singing Chim Chim Cheree on the rooftops of London from Disney's 1964 film, Mary Poppins. As the tour continues, the guy tells guests to hold on to their wallets and purses. As they're entering a bad neighborhood, now the birthplace of the gangster film, the shady underworld of 1930s Chicago, Tom Powers from the 1931 film, The Public Enemy, played by James Cagney, yells for someone to open up a door. Across from Powers are a pair of thugs hiding behind some boxes, looking to start some trouble. One of the thugs, named Beans, tells his partner Squid to get down as the guests make their way down the street. As they pass the thugs, a stoplight turns red and the vehicles come to a stop. While waiting for the light to turn green, a gangster named Muggsy, played by a cast member, emerges from the shadows, demanding the guide hand over control of the vehicle, as they have a lot of pressure on them at the moment. Suddenly, a 1930s car comes screeching down the street, where gangsters start a shootout with Beans and Squid who are still hiding behind the boxes. During the shootout, Muxy chases off the tour guide, hijacking the vehicles with the guests and leaving their accomplices behind, escaping from Chicago with a lack of bullet holes. Now in an old western town, guests encounter the man with no name, played by Clint Eastwood, from the 1966 spaghetti western The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, standing outside of a saloon, and Ethan Edwards, played by John Wayne, from the 1956 film The Searches, sitting upon his horse. If the gangster has hijacked either of the ride vehicles, they continue on to the next scene, but if they didn't, the rarer of the two ride experiences takes place. Here comes a new challenger! When traveling through the town, the tour guide notices that the bank is being robbed. Not wanting to let this happen on their watch, the tour guide tries to stop the bandit, played by a cast member, however, are quickly captured by them. After getting into a shootout with the town sheriff and chasing the tour guide away, the bandit blows up the town bank with dynamite and hijacks the vehicle. Following this scene, the remainder of the attraction is the same no matter who the hijacker was. Out of the wild, wild, wild west and now in outer space, the vehicles have somehow found themselves in the abandoned remains of the Nostromo, the ship from the 1979 sci-fi horror film Alien. As they make their way through the ill-fated spacecraft, guests see Ellen Ripley, played by Sir Journey Weaver, equipped with a flamethrower prepared to take on the Xenomorph, as well as the ship's mother computer warning of self-destruction in 10 minutes. Upon hearing the bad news, the hijacker says, I, I'ma head out, and makes a beeline for the exit, but not before the Xenomorph appears and attempts to attack the guests, emerging from the ceiling and the wall. Escaping the only place where no one can hear you scream, guests now find themselves in an ancient ancient Egyptian tomb from the 1981 film Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Indiana Jones, played by Harrison Ford, and Sala, played by John Reese davies struggle to lift the Ark of the Covenant from the Well of Souls. Making their way deeper into the tomb, the vehicles come across a large altar in the form of the ancient Egyptian god Anubis, where at the top of the altar a large priceless jewel sits, being watched by a cloaked temple guard. The hijacker sees the jewel, stops the ride vehicles, and disembarks to take it and retire from a life of crime. Before taking the jewel, the temple guard gives a warning that those who disturb the treasure of the gods must pay with their life. Calling the guard's bluff, the hijacker reaches out to grab the jewel, only for a plume of fiery smoke to shoot from the ground and engulf the temple altar. Once the smoke clears out, only the remains of the skeletal corpse of the hijacker is left, and the temple guard reveals himself to be the tour guide from earlier, reboarding the ride vehicle and continuing on with the tour like nothing. Nothing ever happened. Out of the temple and into the jungle, guests see Tarzan, played
played by Johnny Weissmuller, Swing By on a Vine as Jane, played by Maureen O'Sullivan, and Cheetah the Chimp from the 1932 film Tarzan the Ape Man Look On. Somehow transitioning from the jungle to an airport, the ride vehicles move past the final scene from the 1942 film Casablanca, featuring Rick Blaine, played by Humphrey Bogart, and Ilsa Lund, played by Ingrid Bergman, as they stand in front of a waiting airplane. The urban legend for the longest time was that the plane in the scene was the actual Lockheed Electra 12A used in the movie. However, this isn't true as no such plane appeared in the film. Instead, Disney had bought a real Lockheed Electra for the attraction, splitting the plane in two. Only the front part of the plane is used for the great movie ride, as the back half appeared in both the studio's backlot tour and eventually was moved to the Magic Kingdom's Jungle Cruise. Leaving Casablanca, guests briefly enter the world of Disney's 1940 animated film Fantasia, starring Mickey Mouse as the Sorcerer's Apprentice. As mentioned earlier, this was originally supposed to be the tornado scene from The Wizard of Oz, which would help explain the transition to the next scene, Munchkinland, complete with Dorothy's house, which has landed on the Wicked Witch of the East. Munchkins pop up from various locations who start to sing Ding Dong the Witch is Dead, welcoming guests to their home, only for a plume of smoke to suddenly rise from the ground as the Wicked Witch of the West, played by Margaret Hamilton, appears and asks if the tour guide is responsible for killing her sister. The tour guide tells the witch they didn't kill anyone, it was an accident, and she better be careful as she has no power here. The tour guide suggests to the witch to keep stepping before someone drops a house on her too. Following the witch's departure, the tour guide wonders aloud how everyone will get home, and right on cue a munchkin appears, exclaiming for the tour guide to follow the yellow brick road. As the ride vehicles follow the yellow brick road, guests pass Dorothy, Tin Man, Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion as they make their way towards the Emerald City. For the grand finale, the tour guide tells guests they hope they've enjoyed this tour through some of the greatest moments at the movies, but have only scratched the surface of what Hollywood has to offer. With thousands of other great movies to discover, this leads to the ride vehicles entering a large theater where a three-minute montage of classic movie moments are shown, made up from over 100 movies from different movie studios with the exception of one, Universal Pictures. When the montage is over, the ride vehicles exit the theater and return to the loading area, where guests on board and exit the attraction. The 22-minute attraction was met with largely positive reception from guests, with its extensive level of detail from some of the greatest scenes in film history, audio animatronics, and live cast members praised. The Great Movie Ride quickly became the cornerstone attraction of Disney MGM Studios, as it completely summed up the concept of the theme park, a place dedicated to Hollywood, a place that exists wherever people dream and wonder and imagine, a place where illusion and reality are fused by technological magic. With the success of Disney MGM Studios, just like with many of its films today, Disney was eager to turn The Great Movie Ride into its own franchise full of sequels and spin-offs. Starting in 1992 ironically in the same park, but now featuring some of Hollywood's most absurd and outrageous characters who are more entertaining than humanly possible, Jim Henson's The Muppets. The Great Muppet Movie Ride was to be a parody of the original, bringing guests through a variety of set pieces in which the Muppets attempted to recreate scenes from classic movies movies, such as Frankenstein and Peter Pan. However, unlike its inspiration, this version of the attraction would explain the guest how movies are produced, featuring the typical ludicrous, lampoon, and self-referential style of comedy the Muppets were known for. Unfortunately, due to Henson's passing in 1992, any hopes of a great Muppet movie ride were shelved, after merger talks between Disney and the Jim Henson Company fell apart. While the Muppets' attempt to take aim at Hollywood was a miss, it didn't deter the House of Mouse from attempting to bring the great movie ride to life elsewhere, specifically to a foreign market. Disney MGM Studios Europe would have been the second theme park built for the Euro Disney Resort, scheduled to open three years after Disneyland Paris in 1995. Just like Disneyland Paris had done, the studio park would refocus the concept to the likings of European guests, including the films that would have been featured in their own version of the great movie ride. I say would have because any plans for the movie park were put on hold around mid-1992 due to the resort being a commercial and financial failure, devastating the company for decades and forcing Eisner to make cancellations, cuts, and changes to many, many, many of the major projects that were in the pipeline at the time. 
Well, if a parody is out of the question and a foreign dub wasn't going to happen, what about just a sequel set in the Golden State instead? A third attempt was made in 2001 to bring the attraction to Disney's new park theme to California's history and culture. Disney California Adventure planned for the Hollywood Pictures backlot section of the park. The attraction would have been very similar to Florida's in layout and design, but with updated scenes to include new classic movies. Basically a reboot of the original that had opened 12 years earlier. However, once again, any plans for the attraction were dropped as part of Eisner's penny-pinching approach to the park, forcing Imagineers to create a ride that I only can assume was just as magical and iconic. Good God, moving right along, don't look at it, it can't hurt you if you're not looking at it. So with any parodies, dubs, or sequels stuck in developmental hell, how was the original attraction doing? Well, not actually much, to be honest. I'm gonna have to talk about that stupid hat eventually, right? Yeah, I figured. Express video it is. Besides the changes made to the Footlight Parade scene, as well as the replacement of the Wicked Witch of the West animatronic with a newer design figure utilizing Sarkos technology, capable of a great deal of more movement possibilities than the original, the only major update took place in 2014 when cable channel Turner Classic Movies, whose programming consists of classic films from the Turner Entertainment Film Library, mainly films from Warner Brothers before 1950 and MGM before 1986, became the sponsor of the attraction. As part of the sponsorship, the attraction underwent a refurbishment, one that saw the pre-show and ride updated with commentary from TCM host and film historian Robert Osborne. In addition, the finale was entirely re-edited with a mix of classic clips, new scenes from previously featured films, and a handful of more recent movies. This updated version of The Great Movie Ride debuted on May 29, 2015 to mix reception, as although Though the fresh coat of paint to the attraction was appreciated, the addition of Osborne's narration during the ride scenes were criticized, as it removed most of the tour guide's role, regarded as one of the selling points of the attraction. Despite the much-needed refurb and new sponsor, it was announced on July 15, 2017 that after 28 years of operation, the curtain would fall on the last remaining opening day attraction in order to make room for its replacement, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, the first attraction ever at a Disney theme park to be themed to Mickey Mouse, based on the 2013 animated series of the same name. It was wine reel in print for the Great Movie Ride on August 13th, 2017. So why did the attraction close? Just like with how Hollywood creates, discovers, and capitalizes on trends, so did the park. While in its first 10 years, Disney MGM Studios kept the focus on behind-the-screen style attractions and as an operating production studio, fewer movies and shows were being filmed at the park, leaving many of its sound stages empty. With the original concept of the park almost non-existent, Disney decided changes were going to have to be made starting with a name change. In 2007, Disney announced that Disney MGM Studios would be rebranded as Disney's Hollywood Studios, effective January 7th, 2008. As Meg Crofton, president of Walt Disney World at the time, put in the press release announcing the name change. The new name reflects how the park has grown from representing the golden age of movies to a celebration of the new entertainment that today's Hollywood has to offer. In music, television, movies, and theater, to put Meg's Quote, in layman terms, we're changing everything about the park because attendance numbers are down and no one wants to make movies here anymore. Over the next few years, the park transformed from a place inspired by show business to a new direction of mesmerizing theming and attractions inspired by blockbuster franchises, which saw the closure of the original non-immersive studio-like rides to make way for dedicated areas like Toy Story Land and Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. In regards to the great movie ride, it was a perfect fit for the park when it opened in 1989, but by the time it closed 28 years later, it had started to show its age. An outdated ride system and movies that, while are considered classics, were not as popular or relevant as they once were, especially with younger visitors. The closure of the attraction officially marked the end of an era in which guests could relive Tinseltown's heyday and step into the world of movies and television to be part of the Hollywood that never was and always will be. 
The Great Movie Ride was a celebration of cinema as both an art form and a business, offering a one-of-a-kind nostalgic trip through Hollywood's past that paved the way we watch movies today. While Disney's Hollywood Studios' longest and most iconic attraction has seen its glitz and glamour fade away, its impact can't be ignored, as it inspired guests like myself to learn more about those classic films featured throughout, as well as being literally responsible for the creation of a brand new theme park at Walt Disney World. It's hard to properly describe what the great great movie ride meant to so many people, so instead I'll leave you with a quote from Robert Osborne that seems to be a fitting way to end this video. There comes a time when even icons, if they choose to do so, should be allowed to enjoy life out of the spotlight. So that is the theme park history of the great movie ride. A special shout out to all my theme park fanatics on my Patreon in the description below. As always, thank you for watching the video and supporting the channel. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if there's any attraction you would like us to cover in a future video, leave a comment down below. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, cut, print, that's a wrap. Great job, everybody. Really knocked it out of the park with this one. I'll see each and every one of you at the premiere, and maybe some of you at the after party. Hey, yo. Hey, Swifty, what's up, my man? It's been a while since we last spoke. What's that? The comeback has been a success so far? I, I know it's been a success. It's great to be back, and I couldn't have done it without you, Hollywood's best agent. What's that? You got a huge project with my name on it? Oh, come on, man. You know me. Anything with my name on it, and I'm sold. Plus, you're my agent. I'm paying you to look out for me in my best interest, and there's no way you're doing this just to exploit me for your own financial gain. What can go wrong? What's that? You want me to take the first flight to California? Ah, oh, come on. First class? Of course. All right, man. I'll see you there. I can't wait to see what you got for me. All right. Ta-ta for now. I guess theme park history is really about to go Hollywood.